Surrounded by the Mutant Rainforest by Bruce Boston. A weak December sun falls like a faltering beacon against the shadows that surround us. We enter another vine-choked alley. The red breath of our laser rifles sizzles through the intrusion of leaves, blackening them to ash. The forest is driven back one more time, but we know it'll return. Once we lived as civilized residents of a civilized metropolis, now we retreat, losing ground to the mutations of the wild. As their multifarious forms multiply, their mythology invades our lives. A compulsion for those who embrace the heresy of a bestial faith. A prison for those of us who resist the onslaught. We survive as a pocket of humanity in a deluge of green terror cut off from the north, facing a relentless enemy from the south. Already more than a third of the city has been abandoned to the wilds. On a routine sweep of city center, I find her in a decaying sub-basement at the old opera house, where the classic tragedies of Verdi and Donizetti had once been performed. The beam of my torch momentarily blinds her dark eyes, unaccustomed to the light. I can see from her stricken glance that she's one that the mutant rainforest has made good use of. She's become a tragedy all her own. The stalk binding her bare body to the bare dirt occurred both graceful and horrific as it clings to the base of her spine. Resembles that of a mushroom, thick and spongy, white blotched by patches of gray. And she's now its naked human cap. My happenstance comrades roaming the deserted stage and hallways above sound the all clear. And after a moment of indecision, I answer in kind, turning my torch away from her eyes, leaving her to the shadows of her damp fungal hermitage and whatever monstrosity she's become. Not a word is exchanged between us. Of course, I recognize her in those flash seconds despite the intervening years and how pale she's become. Yet it is only hours later in the dim halls of the barracks, lying sleepless on my cot among the unending noise of sleeping men, snores and sighs and dream whimpers that I replay the details of our past together. A wealthy landowner's daughter and the son of a servant. We played together as children. The forest was distant then, no more than a threat sometimes used to frighten us into obedience. We played together for hours and days on end, oblivious to our origins, until time and age made them manifest, forcing the adult world into our existence. Then she left me behind for a life of rich parties and shopping sprees, private tutors and trips abroad, a privileged world that I was never allowed to enter. Still, I watched from afar as the girl I'd known began to mature into a woman. And fool that I was, I nurtured an adolescent infatuation that I called love. I embarked upon an awkward courtship, sending her furtive notes to which she never responded. I once stood beneath her lighted window with a cheap guitar and serenaded her with a cheap love song. Only the knight answered, and eventually her father's rage. He insisted that such nonsense must come to an end. My thoughts have returned to her more than once over the years, wistful and unfulfilled. Now I wonder what hazardous course her life had taken that has transformed her into a prisoner and slave of the forest. I know that her father is no longer the wealthy landowner, that the forest has long since claimed as cultivated fields and mansion. Yet how has it seduced her when I had failed? Harboring vague regrets, I drift into a restless sleep. I wake to a scream engendered by someone's nightmare. I don't realize that I'm the culprit, the scream my own, until I hear the exclamations and curses of those around me that I've awakened. 
Whatever that dark dream, it instantly flees from my consciousness. Yet my troubled sleep has formed a resolution in my mind. I dress hurriedly in the dimness and make my way to our makeshift armory. There I choose a machete wetted razor sharp. When I test its edge, a small drop of blood pearls upon my finger. With my laser rifle strapped across my shoulder and the machete strapped into my belt, I enter the dark streets. It is a cold night and a bone-wrecking chill fills the air. Heightened by a light yet steady wind from the south that carries the fragrances of the mutant rainforest into the city. Some claim that it's only this cold that protects us from the forest's ruthless onslaught. They say that with the rains of spring and the heat of summer, the mutations of the forest, both animal and vegetable, will thrive. They'll grow more profligate and insistent, attacking with renewed vigor. Others of my kind, those who sleep by day and guard the city by night, now patrol the streets. I pass freely among them, nodding or exchanging greetings with those I know. I make my way to the city center and the old opera house. A hulking shadow against a cloud-clotted sky that absorbs and diffuses the city lights. There are no stars visible. As I descend into the depths of the building, my torch guiding me, I begin to shiver. It seems even colder here than in the streets above. I've decided that I will either free her from her enslavement or end her life trying. For surely death is a fate preferable to the one she now endures. I find her as I had before, in the same dank subterranean chamber. This time, as my torch exposes her naked body, she gives out a short, sharp cry, more avian than human. Yet her eyes don't blink from the light. Instead, they meet mine in a grave and curious stare. I wonder if she knows who I am. If she recognizes me from our shared past. In my fatigues with my untrimmed beard and shaggy hair, I appear a far different man than the youth she once knew. Just as she must be a far different woman, if woman you could still call her. I wonder how much of her mind and thoughts remain, or if her human awareness has been completely stripped away by the forest. I approach her and raise the machete. Yet as my arm descends to sever the stalk that binds her body to the dirt, she reaches out swiftly to grasp and hold my wrist with a strength I did not expect from her slender form. The blade falls from my hand. She rises up, her arms encircling my neck and pulls me down toward her. She begins soundlessly showering my face and neck with kisses. And fool that I once was, fool that I remain. I fall to my knees beside her, dropping the torch and returning her embrace. It rolls away, throwing its beam against the rough stone wall leaving us in relative darkness. Her bare flesh is not cold but warm to the touch, radiating a heat all its own, stripping the chill from my body. Her mouth and tongue are feverish and urgent. Lying by her side, I awkwardly remove my clothes with one hand, holding her close to me with the other. Although I do not know if she's human or an extension of the forest, it no longer matters. My reason is lost. I begin whispering endearments to her in the dark, speaking her name over and again. She doesn't answer. No sound escapes her lips except for her heavy breathing and the sighs of passion. Then I enter her. And although my body and senses remain engaged in an act both terrifying and sublime, my mind and my body are all at once traveling elsewhere. 
I take on the form of a great bird of keen eye and iridescent plumage sailing high above the earth, flying up through the stratosphere far higher than any bird has a right to fly. I see the continent spread beneath me, the mottled blanket of mutant infestation stretching forth from the Amazon basin to cover near half the land, its tentacles snaking north to the Isthmus and south to Patagonia. I swoop lower and I'm suddenly plummeting downward through dense green leaves and a riotous fluorescence of blossoms to the forest floor. I am a horned jaguar standing over 16 hands high, gliding sinuously through the foliage. My nostrils flared, testing the fragrances of the thick night air in search of prey. I am a millipede python, dropping hundreds of feet through the torturous branches of a towering mahogany onto the muscular back of that same jaguar my spurred legs digging through its fur and into its flesh, injecting its soporific venom, my body winding round its torso, crushing the breath from its body. I am a miniature winged albino monkey. No, a whole tribe of winged albino monkeys. A hive mind, no larger than insects, flitting and leaping and chattering through the highest branches of that same tree. I am a copse of huge black and gold orchids being devoured to extinction by a herd of ravaging tapirs, their variegated hides shaded by saffron and amber and celadon. It is as if through the union of our bodies, the forest and its manifold incarnations are speaking to me, immersing me in their beauty and their horror. I am imbued with the sentience of the forest, not a single sentience as some believe, but a thousand warring ones that conspire to a whole, eliciting an overriding consciousness that wars against the world at large. As if the acts of slaughter and consumption within its borders, the endless round of creation and death and recreation provided with further sustenance and growth. And as my final thrust within her seal our union, I'm hurled from the sum of that consciousness into exhaustion and down a black well of tense sleep and its blackness to which I awaken. I have no idea how many minutes or hours have passed. The batteries in the torch have run down while I slept and we lie together in complete darkness. I try to rise only to find her body rising with me, pulling me back to the earth. I feel a sharp pain along my chest and stomach and thighs. I cry out and she cries with me. In that same piercing avian tone I heard before. Reaching between us, I feel the ropey fungal tendrils that have spread from her flesh to mine. In rising panic, I grapple for the machete. But wherever it has fallen, it's beyond my reach. And it's probably useless in any case. Even if I could stand the pain of severing those tendrils, I'm no doubt already as infected as she. So I wait in the dark, bound irretrievably to a lover I've desired and sought for so long or at least a simulacrum of that lover, just as I'm bound to the mind of the forest. Already I can feel my individual thoughts becoming increasingly cloudy and intoxicated. And I know this is how they'll find us, with their laser rifles in hand, unless our forest finds them first.